by Veronica Roth, The Sun, pages 140 to 160. Though it might seem strange, it's important for high-level Dauntless to understand how a few programs work, Max says. The surveillance program in the control room is an obvious one. A Dauntless leader will sometimes have to monitor the things happening in the faction. Then there's the simulation programs, which you have to understand in order to evaluate Dauntless initiates. Also, the currency tracking program, which keeps commerce in our faction running smoothly, among others. Some of these programs are pretty sophisticated, which means you'll have to be able to learn computer skills easily if you don't already have them. That's what we'll be doing today. He gestures to the woman standing at his left shoulder. I recognize her from the game of Dare. She's young, with purple streaks in her short hair, and more piercings than I can easily count. Lauren here will be teaching you some of the basics, and then we'll test you, Max says. Lauren is one of our initiation instructors, but in her downtime, she works as a computer technician in Dauntless headquarters. It's a little erudite of her, but we'll still let it slide for the sake of convenience. Max winks at her, and then she grins. Go ahead, he says. I'll be back in an hour. Max leaves, and Lauren claps her hands together. Right, she says. Today we're going to talk about how programming works. Those of you who already have some experience with this, please feel free to tune out. The rest of you better keep focused because I'm not going to repeat myself. Learning this stuff is like learning a language. It's not enough to memorize the words. You also have to understand the rules and why they work the way they do. When I was younger, I volunteered in the computer labs in the upper levels building to meet my faction mandated volunteer hours and to get out of the house, and I learned how to take a computer apart and put it back together, but I never learned about this. The next hour passes in a blur of technical terms I can barely keep up with. I try to jot some notes on a piece of scrap paper I found on the floor, but she's moving so fast it's hard for my hand to keep up with my ears, so I abandon the effort after a few minutes and just try to pay attention. She shows examples of what she's talking about on a screen at the front of the room, and it's hard not to be distracted by the view from the windows behind her. From this angle, the pier displays the city skyline, the prongs of the hub piercing the sky, the marsh peeking from between the glimmering buildings. I'm not the only one who seems overwhelmed. The other candidates lean over one another to whisper frantically, asking for definitions they missed. Eric, however, sits comfortably in his chair, drawing on the back of his hand, smirking. I recognize that smirk. Of course he already knows all this stuff. He must have learned it in Erudite, probably when he was a child, or else he wouldn't look quite so smug. Before I can really register the passage of time, Lauren is pressing a button for the display screen to withdraw into the ceiling. On the desktop of your computer, you'll find a file marked Programming Test, she says. Open it. It will take you to a timed exam. You'll go through a series of small programs and mark the errors you find that are causing them to malfunction. They might be really big things, like the order of the code, or really small things like a misplaced word or marking. You don't have to fix them right now, but you do have to be able to spot them. There will be one error per program. Go. Everyone starts frantically tapping at their screens. Eric leans over to me and says, Did your stiff house even have a computer for? No, I say. Well, you see, this is how you open a file, he says with an exaggerated tap on the file on his screen. See, it looks like paper, but it's really just a picture on your screen. You know what a screen is, right? Shut up, I say as I open the test. I stare at the first program. It's like learning a language, I say to myself. Everything has to start in the right order and finish in the reverse order. Just make sure that everything is in the right place. I don't start at the beginning of the code and make my way down. Instead, I look for the innermost kernel of the code inside all the wrappers. There, I notice that the line of the code finishes in the wrong place. I mark the spot and press the arrow button that will allow me to continue the exam if I'm right. The screen changes, presenting me with a new program. I raise my eyebrows. I must have absorbed more than I thought. I, stare, I start the next one in the same way moving from the center of the code to the outside, checking the top of the program with the button, paying attention to the quotation marks and periods and backslashes. Looking for code errors is strangely soothing, just a way of making sure that the world is still in the same order it's supposed to be, and as long as it is, everything will run smoothly. 
I forget about all the people around me, even about the skyline beyond us, about what finishing this exam will mean. I just focus on what's in front of me, on the tangle of the words on my screen. I notice that Eric finishes first, long before anyone else looks ready to complete their exam, but I try not to let it worry me, even when he decides to stay next to me and look over my shoulder as I work. Finally, I touch the arrow button and a new image pops up. Exam complete, it says. Good job, Lauren says when she comes by to check my screen. You're the third one to finish. I turn toward Eric. Wait, I say. Weren't you about to explain what a screen was? Obviously, I have no computer skills at all, so I really need your help. He glowers at me, and I grin. My apartment door is open when I return, just an inch, but I know it closed. I closed it before I left. I nudge it open with the toe of my shoe and enter with a pounding heart, expecting to find an intruder riffling through my things, through I'm not sure, though I'm not sure who, one of Janine's lackeys searching for evidence that I'm different in the same way Amar was, maybe, or Eric looking for a way to ambush me. But the apartment is empty and unchanged. Unchanged, except for the piece of paper on the table. I approach it slowly, like it might burst into flames or dissolve into the air. There's a message written on it in small, slanted handwriting. On the day you hated most, at the time when she died, in the place where you first jumped on. At first, the words are nonsense to me, and I think they're a joke. Something left here to rattle me, and it worked, because I feel unsteady on my feet. I sit in one of the rickety chairs, hard, without moving my eyes from the paper. I read it over and over again, and the message starts to take shape in my mind. In the place where you first jumped on. That must mean the train platform I ascended after I just joined the Dauntless. At the time when she died. There's only one she this could be. My mother. My mother died in the dead of night, so that by the time I awoke, her body was already gone. Whisked away by my father and his abnegation friends. Her time of death was estimated to be around two in the morning, he said. On the day you hated the most. That's the hardest one. Is it referring to a day of the year, a birthday, or a holiday? None of those are coming up, and I don't see why someone would leave a note that far in advance. It must be referring to a day of the week. But what day of the week did I hate most? That's easy. Council meeting days, because my father was out late and would return home in a foul mood. Wednesday. Wednesday, 2 a.m., at the train platform near the hub. That's tonight, and there's only one person in the world who would know all that information. Marcus. I'm clutching the folded piece of paper in my fist, but I can't feel it. My hands have been tingling and mostly numb since I first thought his name. I left my apartment door wide open, and my shoes are untied. I move along the walls of the pit without noticing how high I am and run up the stairs to the pier without even feeling tempted to look down. Zeke mentioned the control room's location in passing a few days ago. I can only hope he's still there now because I need his help if I want to access the footage of the hallway outside my apartment. I know where the camera is, hidden in the corner where they think no one will notice it. Well, I noticed it. My mother used to notice things like that too when we walked through the abnegation sector, just the two of us. She would point out the cameras hidden in bubbles of dark glass or fixed to the edges of buildings. She never said anything about them or seemed worried about them, but she always knew where they were. And when she passed them, she made a point to look directly at them as if to say, I can see you too. So I grew up searching, scanning, watching for details in my surroundings. I ride the elevator to the fourth floor, then follow signs for the control room. It's down a short corridor and around the bend, the door wide open. A wall of screens greets me. A few people sit behind it, at desks, and then there are other desks along the wall where more people sit, each one with a screen of their own. The footage rotates every five seconds, showing different parts of the city. The Amity Fields, the streets around the hub, the Dauntless Compound, even the Merciless Mart with its grand lobby. I glimpse the abnegation sector on one of the screens, then pull myself out of the daze, looking for Zeke. He's sitting at a desk on the right wall, typing something into a dialogue box on the, the left half of the, his screen, while footage of the pit plays on the right half. Everyone in the room is wearing headphones, listening, on, I assume, to whatever they're supposed to be watching. Zeke? I say quietly. 
Some of the others look at me as if scolding me for intruding, but no one says anything. Hey, he says, I'm glad you came. I'm bored out of my... What's wrong? He looks from my face to my fist, still clenched around the piece of paper. I don't know how to explain, so I don't try. I need to see footage from the hallway outside of my apartment, I say, from the last four or so hours. Can you help? Why? Zeke says. What happened? Someone was in my place, I say. I want to know who it was. He looks around, checking to make sure no one is watching or listening. Listen, I can't do that. Even we aren't allowed to pull up specific things unless we see something weird. It's all on a rotation. You owe me a favor, remember? I say. I would never ask unless it was important. Yeah, I know. Zeke looks around again and then closes the dialogue box he had open and opens another one. I watch the Cody types in to call up the right footage, and I'm surprised to find that I understand some of it. After the day's lesson, an image appears on the screen of one of the dauntless corridors near the cafeteria. He taps it, and another image replaces it, this one of the inside of the cafeteria. The next one is of the tattoo parlor, then the hospital. He keeps scrolling through the dauntless compound, and I watch the images as they go past, showing momentary glimpse of, uh, glimpses of ordinary dauntless life. People playing with their piercings as they wait in line for new clothing, people practicing punches in the training room. I see a flash of Max in what appears to be his office, sitting in one of the chairs, a woman sitting across from him, a woman with blonde hair tied back in a tight knot. I put my hand on Zeke's shoulder. Wait. The piece of paper in my fist seems a little less urgent. Go back. He does, and I confirm what I suspected. Janine Matthews is in Max's office, a folder in her lap. Her clothes are perfectly pressed, her posture straight. I take the headphones from Zeke's head, and he scowls at me, but doesn't stop me. Max and Janine's voices are quiet, but I can still hear them. I've narrowed it down to six, Max is saying. I'd say that's pretty good for what, the second day? This is inefficient, Janine says. We already have the candidate. I ensured it. This was always the plan. You never asked me what I thought of the plan, and this is my faction, Max says tersely. I don't like him, and I don't want to spend all my days working with someone I don't like, so you'll, you'll have to let me at least try to find someone else who meets all the criteria. Fine. Janine stands, pressing her folder to her stomach. But when you fail to do so, I expect you to admit it. I have no patience for dauntless pride. Yeah, because the erudite are the picture of humility, Max says sourly. Hey, Zeke hisses. My supervisor is looking. Give me back the headphones. He snatches them from my head, and they snap around my ears in the process, making them sting. You have to get out of here, or I'll, or I'll lose my job, Zeke says. He looks serious and worried. I don't object, even though I didn't find out what I needed to know. It was my own fault for getting distracted anyway. I slip out of the control room, my mind racing, half of me still terrified at the thought that my father was in my apartment, that he wants me to meet him alone on an abandoned street in the middle of the night, the other half confused by what I'd just heard. We already have the candidate. I ensured it. They must have been talking about the candidate for Dauntless leadership. But why is Janine Matthews concerned with who is appointed as the next leader of Dauntless? I make it all the way back to my apartment without noticing, then sit on the edge of the bed and stare at the opposite wall. I keep thinking separate, but equally frantic thoughts. Why does Marcus want to meet with me? Why are the erudites so involved in Dauntless politics? Does Marcus want to kill me without witnesses, or does he want to warn me about something or threaten me? Who is the candidate they were talking about? I press the heels of my hands to my forehead and try to calm down, though I feel each nervous thought like a prickle at the back of my head. I can't do anything about Max and Janine now. What I have to decide now is whether I'm going to this meeting tonight. On the day you hated the most. I never knew that Marcus even noticed me, noticed the things I liked or hated. He just seemed to view me as an inconvenience, an irritant. But didn't I learn a few weeks ago that he knew the simulations wouldn't work on me, and he tried to help me stay out of danger? Maybe, despite all the horrible things he's done and said to me, there's a part of him that is actually my father. Maybe that's the part of him that's inviting me to this meeting, and he's trying to show me by telling me he knows me. He knows what I hate, what I love, what I fear. I'm not sure why that thought fills me with such hope when I've hated him for so long, but maybe, just as there's a part of him that's actually my father, 
there's also a part of me that's actually his son. The sun's heat is still coming off the pavement at 1.30 in the morning when I leave the Dauntless compound. I can feel it on my fingertips. The moon is covered in clouds, so the streets are darker than usual. But I'm not afraid of the dark, or the streets. Not anymore. That's one thing beating up a bunch of Dauntless initiates can teach you. I breathe in the smell of warm asphalt and set off at a slow run, my sneakers slapping the ground. The streets that surround the Dauntless sector of the city are empty. My faction lives huddled together like a pack of sleeping dogs. That's why, I realized, Max seemed so concerned about my living alone. If I'm really dauntless, shouldn't I want my life to overlap with theirs as much as possible? Shouldn't I be looking for ways to fold myself into my faction until we are inextricable? I consider it as I run. Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm not doing a very good job of integrating myself. Maybe I'm not pushing myself hard enough. I find a steady rhythm, squinting at the street signs as I pass them, to keep track of where I'm going. I know when I reach the ring of buildings, the factionals occupy because I can see their shadows moving around behind blacked out and boarded windows. I move to run under the train tracks, the latticed wood stretching out far ahead of me and curving away from the street. The hub grows larger and larger in my sight as I get closer. My heart is pounding, but I don't think it's from the running. I stop abruptly when I reach the train platform, and as I stand at the foot of the stairs, catching my breath, I remember when I first climbed these steps, the sea of hooting dauntless moving around me, pressing me forward. It was easy to be carried by their momentum then. I have to carry myself forward now. I start to climb, my footsteps echoing on the metal, and when I reach the top, I check my watch. Two o'clock. But the platform is empty. I walk back and forth over it to make sure no dark figures are hiding in dark corners. A train rumbles in the distance, and I pause to look for the light fixed to its nose. I didn't know the trains ran this late. All power in the city is supposed to be shut off after midnight, to conserve energy. I wonder if Marcus asked the faction list for a special favor. But why would he travel on the train? The Marcus Eden I know would never dare to associate himself so closely with Dauntless. He would sooner walk the streets barefoot. The train light flashes, just once before it careens past the platform. It pounds and churns, slowly but not stopping. And I see a person leap from the second to last car, lean and lithe. Not Marcus, a woman. I squeeze the paper tighter into my fist and tighter until my knuckles ache. The woman strides toward me, and when she's a few feet away, I can see her. Long, curly hair, prominent hooked nose, black dauntless pants, gray abnegation shirt, brown amity boots. Her face is lined, worn, thin, but I know her. I could never forget her face. My mother, Evelyn Eden. Tobias, she breathes, wide-eyed, like she's as stunned by me as I am by her. But that's impossible. She knew I was alive, but I remember how the urn containing her ashes looked as it stood on my father's mantle, marked with his fingerprints. I remember the day I woke to a group of grave-faced abnegation in my father's kitchen, and how they all looked up when I entered, and how Marcus explained to me, with sympathy I knew he didn't feel, that my mother had passed in the middle of the night, complications from early labor and a miscarriage. She was pregnant? I remember asking. Of course she was, my son. He turned to the other people in our kitchen. Just a shock, of course, bound to happen with something like this. I remember sitting with a plate full of food in the living room, with a group of murmuring abnegation around me, the whole neighborhood packed in my house to the brim, and no one saying anything that mattered to me. I know this must be alarming for you, she says. I hardly recognize her voice. It's lower and stronger and harder than in my memories of her, and that's how I know the years have changed her. I feel too many things to manage, too powerfully to handle, and then suddenly I feel nothing at all. You're supposed to be dead, I say, flat. It's a stupid thing to say. Such a stupid thing to say to your mother when she comes back from the dead, but it's a stupid situation. I know, she says, and I think there are tears in her eyes, but it's too dark to tell. I'm not. Obviously. The voice coming from my mouth is snide, casual. Were you even ever pregnant? Pregnant? Is that what they told you? Something about dying in childbirth? She shakes her head. No, I wasn't. I'd been planning my exit for months. I needed to disappear. I thought he might tell you when you were old enough. I let out a short laugh, like a bark. You thought that Marcus Eden would admit that his wife 
left him. To me. You're a son, Evelyn says, frowning. He loves you. Then all the tension of the past hour, the past few weeks, the past few years builds inside me. Too much to contain and I really laugh, but it comes out sounding strange, mechanical. It scares me even though I'm the one doing it. You have a right to be angry that you were lied to, she says. I would be angry too, but Tobias, I had to leave. I know you understand why. She reaches for me and I grab her wrist, push her away. Don't touch me. All right, all right. She puts her palms up and backs away. But you do understand. You must. What I understand is that you left me alone in a house with a sadistic manic, I say. It looks like something inside her is collapsing. Her hands fall to her sides like two weights. Her shoulders slump. Even, even her face goes slack, as it dawns on her what I mean, what I must mean. I cross my arms and put my shoulders back, trying to look as big and strong and tough as possible. It's easier now, and Dotless Black, than it ever was in Abnegation Gray. And maybe that's why I chose Dotless as a haven. Not out of spite, not to hurt Marcus, but because I knew this life would teach me a stronger way to be. I, she starts, stop wasting my time. What are we doing here? I toss the crumpled note on the ground between us and raise my eyebrows at her. It's been seven years since you died, and you never tried to do this dramatic reveal before, so what's different now? At first, she doesn't answer. And then she pulls herself together, visibly, and says, We, the factionless, like to keep an eye on things. Things like the choosing ceremony. This time, our eye told me that you chose Dauntless. I would have gone myself, but I didn't want to risk running into him. I've become kind of a leader to the factionless, and it's important that I don't expose myself. I taste something sour. Well, well, I say. What important parents I have. I'm so very lucky. This isn't like you, she says. Is even a part of you happy to see me again? Happy to see you again, I say. I can barely remember you, Evelyn. I've almost lived as long without you as I did with you. Her face contorts. I wound at her. I'm glad. When you chose Dotless, she continues slowly, I knew it was time to reach out to you. I've always been planning to find you, after you chose and were on your own, so that I could invite you to join us. Join you, I say. Become factionless? Why would I want to do that? Our city is changing, Tobias. It's the same thing Max said yesterday. The factionless are coming together, and so are the Dotless and Erudite. Sometime soon, everyone will have to choose a side, and I know which one you would rather be on. I think you can really make a difference with us. You know which one I'd rather be on, really, I say. I'm not a faction traitor. I chose Dauntless. That's where I belong. You aren't one of those mindless, danger-seeking fools, she snaps. Just like you weren't a sophisticated stiff drone, you can be more than either, more than any faction. You have no idea what I am or who I can be, I say. I was the first ranked initiate. They want me to be a dauntless leader. Don't be naive, she says, narrowing her eyes at me. They don't want a new leader. They want a pawn they can manipulate. That's why Jenny Matthews frequents dauntless headquarters. That's why she keeps planning missions in your faction to report on their behavior. You haven't noticed that she seems to be aware of things she has no right to be aware of. That's where they keep shifting Dauntless training around, experimenting with it. As if the Dauntless would ever change something like that on their own. Amor told us the fear landscapes didn't, re didn't usually come first in Dauntless initiation, that it was something new they were trying, an experiment. But she's right. The Dauntless don't do experiments. If they were really concerned with practicality and efficiency, they wouldn't bother teaching us to throw knives. And then there's Amor turning up dead. Wasn't I the one who accused Eric of being an informant? Haven't I suspected for weeks that he was still in touch with the erudite? Even if you're right, I say, and all the malicious energy has gone out of me, I move closer to her. Even if you're right about Dauntless, I would never join you. I try to keep my voice from wavering as I add, I never want to see you again. I don't believe you, she says quietly. I don't care what you believe. I move past her toward the stairs I climbed to get up to the platform. She calls after me. If you change your mind, any message given to one of the factionless will go to me. I don't look back. 
I run down the stairs and sprint down the street, away from the platform. I don't even know if I'm moving in the right direction, just that I want to be as far away from her as possible. End of page 160.